Hello again, and welcome to Crime and Music. I'm your host, Brian J. Kinsley, and with me as always, my friend Ben Rubel. That beverage didn't make a big sound there, did it, Brian? You could have helped. I mean, you got one of your I, own. I mean, well, that's not a very highly carbonated beverage. Oh. The, the Dunkel Lagers are not known for their overcarbonation. <sighs> Look at that. That's good. If you like those sounds and the sounds of crime and music stories, you're in the right place because every other Wednesday, this man and I bring you a new crime podcast about people in and around the music business and their misadventures in the law breaking. If you like. Murder mystery, music history, crime history, and more. Check us out wherever you get your podcasts or go to our website, crimeandmusic.com, and uh, check out those things there. Yeah, and I wanted to start the show by wishing Brian a happy Lent. Oh, yeah. Happy, happy Lent, Brian. Happy Lent. I, we got some punch keys upstairs, that's for sure. I got a punch key the other day. <laughs> did I did. You? Yeah. Okay, so I guess maybe a little brief um, definition of what Lent is. Yeah. Brian and I, growing up in the uh, Midwest here in the United States, are both Catholic or at least that's what we were told when we were born. <laughs> yes. Right? I mean, it was right? the religion yeah. closest to our house. It was the religion that our mo- our mothers were. That's what it is. And so the right religion is always really in your neighborhood when you're growing up. <laughs> it's so weird. So it's so Lent is a without getting into the real religious parts of it. It's a time in in the Catholic religion where leading up to Easter, usually like the 40 days that Jesus was in the desert, all the stuff, Easter, Jesus, you're supposed to fast. You're supposed to give stuff up. You're supposed to try to do something. You're Lenten promise. So um, I'm going <laughs> to... Lenten promise. Yeah, well, you got to give, like, when you're a kid, you know, give up sweets or ice cream. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nice okay. to my brother. Yeah, you're right. And as you get older, you know, maybe maybe it turns into something else. So what, what you got, Brian? You giving up anything? You I gave anything? up all my New Year's resolutions. <laughs> Those are gone. Yeah, yeah. So a hard break. What about yourself? What are you giving I'm up for Lent? I'm trying to be a... Uh, I got a teenager at the house. I'm going to try to get along with her a little bit more. I mean... I'm going to try to do better. I'm not going to pull back the curtain as much as you do, but we did run into each other uh, last week in a church, and we didn't burst into flame. So yeah, we're doing something right. I figure something's all right. I expected that whole row behind me to go, oof, right up. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah. none of you people do this. Come on. Yeah. Like, maybe you, but not you and you. I know this. Okay, and I'm not a real practiced Catholic. No. And, I mean, I know all the when to sit and stand parts of church. They changed some of it. Not uh, the sit and stand, well, but some of the words. I'm like, oh. oh yeah, the words. They changed the words. That was a while ago, Brian. Well, I know, I know. I just forgot yeah. that they changed it. Cause... I know, and now you got to say in, in with yeah. your spirit and yes, stuff, whatever. Right. But it's funny when you go to like a, a, a Catholic wedding where there's a whole entire mass yeah. or a Catholic funeral, and that's what we were at. We are at a funeral for a friend's This mom. is good. You don't like this beer? Eh. Frankenmuth Brown Hound Dunkel Lager. No, it's, yeah, I thought you would like it. I did. I did. Right. Thank you. It's very good. So uh, if you sit further up in the church, right? Um, maybe the people that are in the reserved seats in the front of the church, you know, the family, yeah. they're, they're there to honor the either people getting married or the, you know, the, the p- person that passed away. Um, so a lot of times they don't know the 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 pageantry of the mass, the sits oh, yeah, and the yeah. stands and the this yeah. and the that's. I'm pretty good at it. I'll sit next to my mom. She knows that stuff. I mean, <laughs> yeah. In fact, I think she might have invented something. She helped write the book and the reform. But it's always fun. I was at a I was at a wedding years ago. Um, no, it was a baptism years ago. There you go. And the whole entire family is of the kid getting baptized, the aunts and the uncles and the nie- and the nieces and nephews. They're all sitting in the first two rows of the church. So they don't have any of the visual cues on when to sit. And st- they're doing nothing. <laughs> they're just sitting there, <laughs> and they're not looking behind them as the whole entire rest of the congregation, which is just a regular Sunday morning service. People at church. People are sitting and standing and kneeling, and these, these, these heathens are just, which if they were about five rows back, they'd have some cue on, <laughs> oh, I'm supposed to. Sit now. Oh, it's the, kneel? I got to kneel again? How many times do we kneel in here? My wife and I have said that when we're out at, like, events we are unfamiliar with. I'm like, church rules. When they stand, you stand. When they sit, you sit. Yeah, the like, only church rule I don't follow, though, is uh, it's different from church to church, too, yes, by the way. Always. I don't like the hand-holding during the Our Father. I don't like it. I was in a row of, of gentlemen that I knew were not going to do. As a matter of fact, every single dude sitting next to me when I saw you at that church went hands crossed down the center. You yeah, know, like uh, you just uh, hold your hands in the center, just like, yep, and, just and, chilling. And it's just, a, it's just a weird. Like, way to go, Christians. And so, I mean, my mom's on my left side. My wife's on my right side. I'm, like, I'm not holding anybody's hand. I'm not doing it. You were set between your mom and your wife, and you didn't hold anybody's hand. Ah. Uh, I gave them a handshake during the handshake part. Yeah. I gave them maybe even a hug and a peck in the cheek. Get your but sign nah, of nah, peace. Nah, nah. Coronavirus, man. 
Yeah, dude, uh, talk virus. about <laughs> talk about rapid switch. Uh, coronavirus. I'm not getting that from you, mom. You keep your own coronavirus over there. I think your mom has coronavirus, and you probably have coronavirus. Well, yeah, if you have ever had it, like the common cold is a form of the coronavirus. You got a Bud Light virus right now. I need a Bud Light virus. <laughs> All, right. All right, let's get into this week's Guess the Guest. Are you ready to guess the guest? Ah, yes. Yes. All right. This week, uh, I'm going to stop saying it's different because you know what? We just do whatever we want nowadays. It's always different. I do what different. I want. I do what I want. Guess the guest this week. It's a, uh, it's a whole band. It's a whole band. I'm going to okay. tell you it's a whole right, band. Good, right? good. It's the and, only thing I got. And I'm going to ask my one question. Is it somebody I know? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Good. Whole band. Somebody right. I know. Whole band. These are the guys in the band. I bet I get it. These are their names. I bet I get this. I didn't write it down anywhere, so no, yeah. No, I bet okay, I get good. it. Uh, these are guys in the band. The Bear. Okay. Blind Owl. Sunflower. The Mole. Fito. 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 F-I-T-O. Fito. All right. No. I don't no. get any of that. No. Uh, here's a clue. Sterno. 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 Okay. That's that stuff that you keep under a... Like, uh, um, like a uh, chafing uh, dish. Uh, yeah, cha- yes. a very good chafing dish. There you all go. Right. Been studying all morning for this. Yeah, somebody um, go Google chafing dish for me real quick. All right. Playing a recording of cheering or booing through the arena sound system or adding it to a taped show to either amplify the crowd's reaction or to mask silence from the crowd. Um, Canned laughter. Oh, my God. You're so close. Go back to sterno. Sterno laughter. <laughs> well, no. What's a sterno? What is sterno? Describe it. Like, it's a it's a it's a flammable liquid in a can that you light on fire, sterno. So it Lit. is canned fire or canned canned butane. What does fire give off? Canned heat? Yes, canned heat. Okay. Oh my gosh, you got well, it. You really had to I forgot really what that was. You really had to walk me to that one because I still don't know who it is. <laughs> I don't canned, know that. canned heat. I don't know that. Do I know that? Canned heat is an American rock band formed well, let's let this run out. Dude, I don't think I know them, though. Thank you, Kevin McLeod and The Hustle, our music for Guess the Guest. 1965, formed in Los Angeles, California. Canned Heat, an American rock band known for blues rock, boogie rock, appearances at the Monterey Pop Festival, and Woodstock. Okay, I did. I thought I remembered the name only from a previous episode, and that was the Monterey Pop, Pop Festival. Festival. Yeah. And are they, are they, which ones do they do? Hair of the Dog? Uh, no, we'll get there in a sec, but they're basically the theme of Woodstock. Okay. All right. All right. All right. We'll get to that story I need, too I just about them. One but, song to- but no, that's them. You'll know a couple more too that they have. I've been listening to it for like a week now. It's really good. This is right in our wheelhouse of 70s rock, 60s rock. So. Okay. Candy. We're going to learn yep. everybody. Sit down. <laughs> We're going to take you on about 60. 60- that's a pretty yeah, fast stat. It is. 62 cards. 60, 62 cards 63, of uh, cards. learning about Canned Heat. Candy Heat. We'll learn together. Their music and attitude attracted a large following and established the band as one of the most popular acts of the hippie era. So they're hippies. Uh, oh, yeah. They appeared at most major musical events at the end of the 60s, performing blue standards along with their own material and occasionally indulging in lengthy psychedelic solos. LSD, baby. Trippy shit. 1965, the group was started with a community of blues record collectors. That's they were just record collectors. Yeah, this guy Bob Height, uh, he'd been trading blues records around for a long time since he was like in his teens and stuff. And his house was kind of like the house where kids would gather up and listen to records, and people would hang out there. It was known as a house or meeting place for interesting people and people interested in music. Okay. So um, he is a mansion in the Hollywood Hills, basically where Elvis Presley used to live when he made some of his movies out there in California. And this this is the guy that had Elvis over to his house? Well, no, this is Elvis's house when he lived in California. It's just that same house. Okay. This guy All Bob right. took it over, serious partying. All right, like that Mama Cass slash yeah. whatever apartment, apartment in New York. Yep, exactly. Um, <laughs> so this is the guy that was the one of the record collector guys? Yes. Okay. So one day, some blues guys were there, decide, and they decided to form a jug band. A jug like blowing in an old jug. I was with like, you X, know what a jug X, band X on is? It. Right? Yeah, that's the one. We got some <laughs> sourdough in there. <laughs> just guys just blowing on jugs. So, but they're. I don't know why I'm keying on this record collector. <laughs> there isn't everybody in the '60s and '70s a record collector. I mean, it's not like it's that odd. Well, let's put it this way. My wife will say she loves music, and then she's like, "Oh, I love this song." I'm like, "Tell me who sings it." She's like, well, I don't know that. You know. So it's now it's like the people who are like, "Oh, that's." Uh, 
Walk This Way, Aerosmith uh, A-Side in the 1978, whatever, whatever release, you know. So so Adam and I have started collecting a couple records. There you go. And playing them in the woodshop. Yeah. And we got a real weird collection going right now. It's not a lot. <laughs> I mean, we probably got sure. just 40 or 50. We don't, we just, if somebody wants to give us a couple or we find some at a dollar store or sure. in the record store, we'll grab a couple. I got a couple Rush. There's some Neil Diamond. Nice. There's some CCR. Yeah. But then there's even like Bubba Sparks and some weird ones. Oh, just yeah? weird ones. Well, another um, acquaintance I, I, of mine. Yep. Um, he's a cool dude, big time into the music industry. He does some reporting and photography for like a lot of um, uh, punk and heavy metal stuff. Is kind of his genre. All right. And so he'll listen to a record, and he has a huge collection. And he does a neat thing. He he puts a record on a turntable, and then behind the turntable, he puts the 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 the, the sleeve, the record yeah. holder dealio, the album cover, the album cover. And he'll take a picture of it and put it on Facebook. I mean, that's kind of neat. That's and neat. so a lot of it, I've never, I don't know who that is. I don't know how old it is. Don't know anything. But the next thing you know, I he's he's still collecting modern. People are putting out vinyl today because he had a Billy Eilish on there. Oh, no. Nice. Eilish. 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 We're Midwestern. Eilish. We say Eilish. Yeah. Eilish. Uh, from what I've heard, um, in 2019, vinyl outsold CDs. CDs? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah it was. It was uh, I remember that little article, yeah. That's weird, man. Eh, vinyl's fun. I like it. Vinyl's cool. It's fun. It is. I mean, it's more fun than those tapes. You see the record spinning and it's pops spinning. And, yeah, it's still spinning. That's Flint thing. Yeah, um, I still want to. Okay. I still, I still want to find out the trickery involved inside the mechanics of an eight track. Oh, you know, it's one okay. continuous loop of tape. Yes. How does that work? They measured it. Well, I mean, <laughs> so how they, they wrap know the, up in there? They know the physical distance, and then they did their whole Rube Goldberg design. I don't know either. You're I don't right. know. I, I want to crush one and look at it. Sounds like, I feel like that you could do. All right. We're, All right. right, so they got this jug band. They're hanging out at Bob's house, the old Elvis mansion in Hollywood. And they got, they got, then they get this, uh, they get a bass player. They get drums. They got a guy on guitar. And then they got a guy on bottleneck guitar. Bottle is that where it's like wheel, like steel wheel, guitar wheel. almost kind of okay. yeah but playing the bottle and then this other friend of Bob's this guy Henry Vestine he was expelled from Frank Zappa's band Mothers of Invention for smoking too much pot and uh, he asked if he could join the band and they're like yeah man we we're just yeah <laughs> whatever <laughs> sure all right so uh, don't expect to pay you right? <laughs> they got all these dudes around everybody's playing music you know they got their garage band set up and then they hear this Tommy Johnson song called the Canned Heat Blues. It's a song about an alcoholic who had desperately turned to drinking Sterno, generically called Canned Heat, back there in 1914. Drinking Sterno? Yeah. You, you can drink Sterno? Uh, you're not supposed to. No, that's bad. Okay. So Sterno Canned Heat is where they got it. I know uh, there's some rather desperate people in this world that will inhale things like Sterno and oh even some like gasoline that to, get a, so to get a high. Yeah, I didn't think drinking it would be better. No, it's like you're not supposed to drink rubbing alcohol. Don't. No, Kitty Dukakis. Yeah, they. <laughs> uh, there's this producer out there, Johnny Otis, records the band's first album in 1966. So basically, they just had all these people popping by, and they're like, "Yeah, it sounds pretty good. Let's uh, let's put this on tape." Don't they put something in rubbing alcohol to make it undrinkable, like bad for you? Well, it's like ethyl alcohol versus methyl alcohol, or something like that, right? Like the co- the chemical compound is one is toxic to. What would it taste like with lime? Probably better, like Bud Light Lime. Eh. Yeah. All right. It works. Things to do. So uh, they recorded this album in 1966, but it wasn't released until 1970. So it kind of sat around on the shelves for four years. They probably got a good buzz going and forgot about it for a while. Yeah. Well, their bass player, Stu Bro- Brotman, he leaves the band. He signed a contract for uh, another thing in Fresno with the Armenian Belly Dance Review. That makes sense. So they lost their bass player to the Belly Dance Review. Hey, a seriously good belly dancer is mesmerizing. I would give you that. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's sexy, I guess, but it's also like, what? <laughs> like, how do you, how do you <laughs> hips move like that, Shakira? What? La, 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 la. Shakira. Uh, the guys contacted Stu. They're like, dude, we got a record contract. Um, it's got to be signed the next day. Stu's like, I can't, I'm not, I can't do it. So Stu goes on, does his world thing. They replace Stu, but that guy only lasts a couple months. He leaves to go be the bass player for a band called Spirit. And finally, they land on this dude, Larry Taylor. Larry Taylor. Larry Taylor. Okay. Now, he was a former member of the Moondogs, and he's a brother of the Ventures drummer, Mel Taylor. You know the Ventures. We're talking about surf rock now. I mean, like... 
<laughs> you know, like surf right. guitar and stuff. So they're picking up these dudes. This guy, Larry, uh, he worked with Jerry Lee Lewis, Chuck Berry, did some recording sessions for the Monkees. Smell my fault, baby. So he's, yeah, see, he's in the know. He knows that yeah. joke, and he's like, I'm not, no, I'm not going yeah, anywhere. That's weird. I'm not going anywhere near that. April 1967, the lineup for Canned Heat is Bob Height, vocals, Alan Wilson, bottleneck guitar. Bob Allen, okay. Henry Vestine, guitar. Henry. Skip Taylor, bass, Skip. and a dude named Frank Cook on the drums. These couldn't be more white names. I'm serious. It's a jug band. Henry, from California. Frank, <laughs> Stu, Bob. Henry, Rob, no. Bob, yeah. a- Bob Allen, Henry, Skip, and Frank. <laughs> they start recording uh, for Liberty Records. Are you sure that this is not, this is not canned heat? This is white bread. <laughs> I think it's just bread. But... Bread. I have a bread album too, by the way. That's put we it on. Have, That's a good album. We have a bread album. You got the right bread album, man. You got some good uh, is shit there on one? There. Is there? Is there? Is Did, there right didn't one? didn't Clapton play for bread? All right. If you know the answer to that, please yeah. write us in cramandmusic dot anything or com. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Yeah. Uh, they start recording for this Liberty Records with this guy Calvin Carter. Cream. That was cream. There you go. You're right. Yeah. He was the head of A&R for VJ Records and recorded blues guys like Jimmy Reed, John Lee Hooker. They recorded Rollin' and Tumblin' back with the Bullfrog Blues. Uh, this became Can Heat's first single, Rollin' and Tumblin'. Rollin' and Tumblin'. I wish I could sing it, but I can't remember that one. I don't know. I'm Can Heat. I'm still not in Can Heat. I don't remember all that name. Well, we'll get you there. All don't right. Worry. Well, I know that song. Yeah, right. There's, there's more that yeah. come up that are more popular. I think it's now on an, like an insurance commercial. I think you're right. I think you're right. Going like, to the country. Like, yeah. Okay. Up the country. Their first official album, Canned Heat, was released three months later, July 1967. All the tracks were reworkings of old blues songs, so they were all covers. The LA Free Press reported, quote, this group has it. They should do very well, both live and with their recordings. How yeah. was their first record? The album did reasonably well, reached number 76 on the Billboard charts. Is that is that reasonably well? I mean, you cracked the top 100. Eh, I guess. You're almost in the... Top seventy five percent. I don't know. Back then, I don't. Maybe there were a lot of bands getting put out. Well, that's the thing, though. Back then, that was what you listened to because you didn't have all this segmentation that we have now. Like, you can't just go listen to your Billy Eilish and that's all. Oh, my Billy Eilish. Well, that's your. That's what you call her. Eilish. I, 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 I June. Like, I, I I like her songs. I like it too. I don't, celebrate her entire catalog. Don't be a bad guy. Duh. <laughs> nice. I don't even know. If you I just did... let it go. It doesn't funnier. I can't help it. That was really good this early in the morning. Uh, June 17th, 1967. Their first big live appearance is at the Monterey Pop Festival. About 35,000 people. It was a three day concert held in Monterey County Fairgrounds, Monterey, California. The festival is remembered for the first major American appearance by the Jimi Hendrix Experience, The Who, Ravi Shankar, and also the first large scale public performance of Janis Joplin. That was a good, that was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it right Yeah, there, that right? sounds good. Like they, they did everything right. We can't talk about them, though. Who? No, we can talk about the who we oh, did. Oh, yeah. The- no. <laughs> the Monterey Pop Festival. Yeah, no, nothing. Yeah, they, everything yeah. went on good. Downbeat Magazine wrote an article complimenting the Heat playing at the event saying, quote, technically, Vestain and Wilson are quite possibly the best two guitar team in the world, and Wilson has certainly become our finest white blues harmonica man. Uh, together with the powerhouse vocals, Bob Height. They perform the country and Chicago blues idiom of the 1950s so skillfully and naturally that the question of which race music belongs to becomes totally irrelevant. Hmm, that was a lot of words. Yeah, well, I didn't realize race belonged to, or music belonged to a race. I it just, does, dude. Let's not, I mean. I wasn't thinking about it when I wrote that down, right. though. I was like, oh, I was just writing. Like, oh. Big band music. White people. Yeah, mostly. Yeah. I the mean. Folk. It, it, R&B. Black people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, love, uh, 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 Latino music. Latinos. <laughs> yeah. Hispanics religion. October 21st, 1967, the Heat book a show in Denver, Colorado at a bar called The Family Dog. The Family Dog. Yeah, it's owned by a dude named Chet Helms. They had some dealings with, like, the, uh, ballrooms and stuff in the East Coast and the West Coast. You know how they go, oh, we're at the such and such ballroom. Like, mm-hmm. these people, these people own them. I, I'll I'll sit awake some nights in my bed thinking about fun bar names or restaurant names. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there's a part of me that wants to open, open up a, a little restaurant or a little bar. I mean, oh, yeah. I think everybody's there, right? Everybody's oh. got this little yep. idea. So my latest one is the thing about a, a, a opening up. A, like, if you're from the South, you know that there are some barbecue places that only sell one thing. Like, 
You're getting ribs. Ribs. There's the what we don't need a menu. It's ribs. That's it's not it's, what do you want? It's how much do you want? Chicken and ribs. And Pick I would one. like to do that here. Just one thing. Nice. I don't want to have a kid. I don't want to have a dining room. You just come get your ribs and go home. Or <laughs> eat on a picnic table. Whatever. I don't care. Take okay. Out. So take this, away. I'm thinking that's what I want to do this week. And so <laughs> it'll go away. Don't worry. You got bar names for you? What do you got? I want to start thinking about rib joint names. Like maybe the rib joint. <laughs> That's a good name. I'm, right. There you go. Yeah. And you or would just serve, ribs. <laughs> then make sure you just serve yeah. only brisket, though, and it's called just ribs. And then I also thought, you know, there's also the marketing part of me that just wants to name it after the city it's in. So people, if they hear about it, know where to go. Oh. You know, like. Adla- don't, Atlanta Ribs. Yeah. It, or or Grand Blank Rib Factory. <laughs> Whatever, you know. Now I it's mean, a factory? Oh, okay. Burlington, Co- if Burlington <laughs> Coat Factory can get away with naming their thing a factory. It's not a factory, by the way. I used to work there. It's not. I thought maybe there'd be some people in the back sewing up a coat. No, there's not. I worked at Burlington Coat Factory as undercover security in the leather coat department. Yeah? Oh, oh. You heist a couple leather coats, Brian? Only busted one kid. Yeah. No, it wasn't me. All right. Never, we got, never caught we me. got cameras for that right now. <laughs> So here's the thing, though. It's important, this uh, this show they book in Denver, right? Okay. Um, Denver police hated the idea of hippies coming to their city, and they Dirty did everything hippies. they could to even stop this family dog club from opening, Like, right? This guy, Helms, though, he was real smooth, and he met all the legal requirements. So when the club finally opened, Helms and his people just constantly, the cops are in doing harassment, illegal searches, and raids, and stuff like that. They're like, you ain't having no hippie club here in Denver. We don't need your type around here. I don't like your type around here, long hair. Let's talk about the Denver cops back then, real quick then. Um, like most places in the United States in the 60s, Denver used to be terrified of young men who didn't have what they call, quote, regular man's haircut. Like the long hairs, you know, shags, and basically dirty, stinky hippies. Well... I had a barber that said the Beatles almost put him out of business in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> He's like, between the Beatles and all the other music out there and what the culture was going through at that time. That makes sense. People didn't get their hair cut then. He Damn, says, I hairs. about went out of business. And he wasn't, I mean, that wasn't a joke. He was legitimately. So I brought it up. That guy was also an idiot. But <laughs> I brought that up just the other day to my current barber, who is about 40 he's about our age whatever all right um but his the barbershop that he runs has been in his family since his great grandfather oh geez it just gets handed right down and his kids are gonna do it i'm sure too but i said that i said that to my buddy chad and he's like yeah i hear stories about that time back then he says, <laughs> I hear stories. My, my, my dad and my grandpa tell him about the barbershop people didn't people didn't get their haircuts I went through a phase where I had really, 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 really long hair, but I would still get a trim once a month just to make sure all the dead ends were cut off and all that stuff. Just get like, the split end. Just yeah. Take the split ends. It's healthy, you know, and I didn't want to screw my barber over. Yeah, I, 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 I want to make sure it looks nice and neat and straight, and even at the ends, just like Edgar Winter. That's a good long hair reference. Yeah, he's I, Edgar Winter. He's always had like just, like you could just, his flowing. Just like clear white, too. Yeah. Uh, white eyebrows. <laughs> Uh, speaking of white guys, we got Denver narcotics detective, John Gray. Like how I went from white to gray. Yeah. Uh, he was particularly horror stricken by hippie culture. He was known as quote, the Wyatt Earp of the West. Did you say horror? No. Oh, horror. Horror stricken, not horror stricken. No, this dude wasn't about that, man. He was back to those church people you were talking about in the beginning. Okay. Uh, he has a promise, um, for Denver says, quote, I'm going to rid Denver of all the long haired people. Now, he did not specify he's talking about men or... He can't get away saying that stuff today, can he? Ah, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> well, I mean, unless you're president, but whatever. <laughs> hey, hey. Uh, according to drummer Frito De La Pera, remember we talked about Fido, Frito, Fido? Fido, Fido. Fido yeah. Is it Fido? F- F-I-T-O. Fito. Fito. Fido. Fito. Uh, Fido says, the guys didn't bring any dope to Denver because they knew things were tough there at... Imagine this. You don't bring weed to Denver. I know, right? (laughs) Everybody in Denver right now barely can remember this. What are you talking about? They showed up clean to play that gig. Uh, Bob the Bear, singer, he grew up in Denver Denver before moving to L.A., so he knew what was going on. So they were all clean, right? Just some edibles. Yeah. Well, I don't know. But uh, anyway. They had edibles back then. So, But they weren't anything powerful like we have nowadays. You got nuclear option now. (laughs) Jeez. Those hippies wouldn't know what hit them. I think a lot of old hippies today are trying this new... The new forms of marijuana are just like, all right, just give me my old skunk weed, man. No, you took it too far. Guys. I'm good with that stuff. <laughs> took it too I still got to stand at the end of the night. God. Somebody's got to call the Social Security office in the morning. <laughs> so, uh, like that, right? Uh, the bear and the guys are in Denver. Cracking a fresh one? 
Oh, yeah, I'm thirsty. There you go. Uh, he's got this old school high school friend who shows up at the hotel where the Heat were staying, right? All right. And Bob knew him, so he kind of trusted the guy. All of a sudden, Bob looks up. His old school chum's gone. Like, I, don't, I don't know where he went. I don't know where he went, man. Dude left. Next thing you know, cops come busting into the score. Ugh. Cops You're on a roll here today, Brian. You got to untie that tongue. This beer is too good. It's very tasty. <laughs> you blame it on the alcohol. On the a- 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 alcohol. If that's a song. Uh, the cops come busting in to discover a lid of grass underneath the seat cushion in the exact chair where Bob's friend was sitting. A what? Oh. Oh, yeah. What a dick. The Denver police sent in a stool pigeon to socialize a little, get the band high. They did get high? Set him up. That's what he said. And then he planted the drugs under the couch? Yep. What a uh. I, I'm sorry. I thought you were gonna p- pick up on stool pigeon. So I have, nah, I have a card. I'm in still mad about this guy. <laughs> the stool pigeon. That was him. The stoolie. Literally a decoy bird. In the more common and figurative meaning, a police informant, criminals lookout. The expression derives from the hunting practice of fixing a dead or replica pigeon to a stool to act as a decoy to attract other birds. Stool okay. pigeon. Stool pigeon. So Bear swore that the band members, knowing the city's reputation, actually didn't have any drugs with them that night. They're like, dude, we knew you were going to do this. We don't have any drugs. <laughs> they arrested everybody on charges of marijuana possession. It was well, sh- they, they, sent their, they sent their old boy in there to go plant <laughs> some weed. <laughs> That's correct. So what do we learn is never trust your old high school friends, ever, if you make it big and then Check. you want to hang out. Check. <laughs> and then uh, always keep an eye on them. Make sure you know your stash is. Check. So this is a huge problem See, for Denver in the, the 60s. Third, the third thing in there. The third? Make sure you got dirt on them. Oh, that, yeah, yeah, that, right? That, you know. You want to get you want to get nuts? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get nuts. <laughs> All right. So you got Skip Taylor, their manager, right? He's the one guy who did have drugs on him. Mutual destruction. But he wasn't with the band. He was in a hotel room with the girl, and then the cops went and arrested him anyway, right? So the cops bust in the door. The guy's in his hotel room on top of this girl. The cops are like, you with the band? Like, yeah. No, I'm with her. Shut up. Right? And he sees he's wearing a blanket. You know, he's sitting there. The girl's wearing the sheet. Blowing up my spot here, dude. Sitting on the nightstand, wrapped in tinfoil, was a flat chunk of super rich dark brown Afghani hashish. Ooh, some hash, man. Looked like a Hershey bar. And the cop goes... You're going to have to come with us, sir, and uh, the rest of the band. And sorry, ma'am, I uh, didn't mean to bother you with this, but you can finish that chocolate bar all on your own. And then they leave. <laughs> <laughs> what a bunch of rubes. Denver. Straight out of Denver, baby. The only real dope in the place, they missed it. The band was hauled off to jail after a search. A judge was not available to set bail until Monday, so the boys spent the weekend in jail. Bail set at $10,000, right? Dude, I had the best... The absolute, hands down, easiest, no questions asked, best Mexican food in my life. <laughs> better ever. be okay. I was like, this better be relevant, dude. <laughs> right. Dude, I was sitting down. So this guy, I was there working. What? Oh, Brian's just gonna put the cards down. He's. Like, I can take a drink now. Of this <laughs> awesome brown hound beer that Ben brought. So me. Uh, he's like, hey, I'll, you like Mexican food? I'm like, I love Mexican food. Love it. And one of the big dings I have about a lot of Mexican plate, it's the same four or five ingredients, whatever, in a different shell. <laughs> Meat, cheese, whatever. and tortilla. Just say something Spanish and I'll bring it to you. Yeah, you, it's all the same. What's whatever. in the, what's in the uh, burrito? That's Which some meat, some cheese, and tortilla. It's fine. They nailed it. You got cheese, you got meat, it's and in the you enchilada. got some sour cream and some bread. It's all good. It's, I'm, it's I'm a loving Jim Gaffigan it. bit. Just I'm loving it. Say it's something okay. Spanish, I'll bring you something. Yeah, so I, I, I go to this place. <laughs> First Denver. thing they do is... Uh, they you just they you get a margarita, limit Love it. limit one. Oh why? Yeah, this is a real for real oh, margarita. Gotcha. No, you got one. The gringos and they know they don't. You don't need one. You split one. Get two straws. <laughs> like, you know. So, um, and I said, well, I want the house specialty. You know, I don't know. I don't want to have to order something. Bring me what you think I want. Bring me the good thing. Bring me what you're known for. And so the guy says something Spanish, just like. <laughs> I'm the guy I'm with. He's old. Bring, bring him. The, you like fish? I'm like, oh, fish. Ooh, fish. Brian, I'm not kidding. They brought me a plate with a fish on it. Oh, <laughs> like no tortilla, no cheese. Head, tail, oh. scales, everything. Just this fish. They baked it. They Got put, the eye looking at you. The, the whole fish is about uh, this big around. It's about the like uh, diameter, the, size of a football. Not, oh wow! Not thickness of a football, but like the round, just a fish. Like a soul? Like what I don't know what kind of fish it is. It's and bass? so. I, I, I got this fish and I'm looking down and I look over at the table next to me. <laughs> Somebody else got the same dish. It's just a there's a fish. They just cut right into the middle of the fish like it's a steak. I, I'm like, All really? Right. 
They just pick right through the fish. Eat the fish. It's good. I'm afraid of fish bones. Well, you know, you pick now this fish. I don't know if it was maybe because it was a bigger fish or an older fish or a specific <sighs> kind of fish. Brian, sorry, Michelle. Hey, that was your beer. I can't be held <sighs> responsible. All right, listen. thanks, Nick. I blame Nick, but sorry, Michelle. So you just this fish is the bones stayed very in place. So when you're done, yeah, yeah, no. very much so. Did it just look like a skeleton of a fish? You yeah, know, yeah, like yeah, Scooby Doo yeah. sort of skeleton of a. I don't know. You know, you just Brr. like. Whatever. Fish. Great, though. Oh, my gosh. It was seasoned. I think they had some herbs and spices on the inside of the fish. I mean, they gut. It was gutted. It yeah, didn't yeah. have the gut, guts in it, but it had full-on head and tail and fins and everything uh, with some herbs in there. It was good. There's some sauce they brought with it on the side, and then you had, like, a little side dish of some beans and rice or whatever. Nice. Holy cow. I've never seen anything. I liked it. Somebody please point me to a place in mid-Michigan. Denver, huh? Denver. Denver had a lot of good a lot of good uh, Mexican huh. rust. Well, I mean, this was... This was, uh, yeah, it was 90s? good. Yeah. Um, I want to say Barada. I know a guy with the last name Barada. No, I think it's a type of fish that they cook a whole fish. It's called Barada. No. Oh, all right. Let's go with that. Let me know. Right. Let me know. Let me know. So anyway, uh, you're, in, you're in Denver. She's got her hash bar that she's going to do. They get bail for $10,000. Okay. I mean, that's a chunk of change. For right? everybody? Or like, for everybody. Like, everybody, like right? it, It's as a group bail. Yes. Group, group bail. The, the heat is <laughs> bail set at $10,000. <laughs> all right. So, here's the problem. Um, in a gin rummy game in Los Angeles with this guy Al Bonnet, I feel like you skipped the card here. I did. It? I did. Uh, I'm just. What, I'm, what I'm happened detailed. to the band of in Denver? They're in Denver still. But let's flash to a gin rummy game in L.A. with a guy named Al Bonnet. Okay. He's the president of Liberty Records. The Heat is signed at Liberty Records. Skip's talking to him. He's like, "Hey, man, I need ten G's like now." And this guy Al's a shrewd businessman. He offers him 10 G's, but he wants 50% of the publishing rights to the band's works. Oh, so he's not. <laughs> oh, yeah, baby. I mean, okay, so these uh, these old white racist cops in Denver <laughs> got this guy's arm twisted behind yep. his back and the other arm's handcuffed to a jail cell, <laughs> and he's negotiating. We're laughing, but it's so sad because Can't Heat doesn't make gonna, any money what, for decades. What are you going to do? Like, right, we'll get there. So they get the 10 grand. They send over, sign over the 50% royalty rights to this guy, Al Bonnet. Uh, the deal is done. The band is sprung. They only end up getting probation. It was like figuratively holding him over a balcony by his ankles. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, they were pissed, dude. They wrote a song about it. The, they, they have a song called My Crime, which tells the story of what went down. Here's the lyrics to My Crime, okay? Uh, my Crime by Canned Heat. I went to Denver late last fall. I went to do my job. I didn't break any law. We worked in a hippie place, like many in our land. They couldn't bust the place, so they got the band. Because the, the police in Denver know they don't want long hairs hanging around. And that's the reason why they went to tear Canned Heat's reputation down. All right. That, this one, is like a literal. One verse of a, my crime. A literal story of what happened. <laughs> the bear said to a reporter at the time, quote, to sing the blues, you have to be an outlaw. Blacks are born outlaws, but we white people work to have that distinction. We got to earn that. <laughs> it's terrible. Dude. Blacks are born outlaws. Jeez. Don't worry. The bear gets his. It's fine. Okay. Foreshadowing. Uh, being led away in handcuffs, kicked off the band's image as bad boys of rock, heavy-duty, incorrigible-type people, bad hippies, eventually leading to the Heat becoming a favorite band of the Hells Angels Biker Club and other outlaw biker clubs throughout America and the world. And the world. The family dog closed in July 1968 after a decreased patronage due to the injunction they got against the police not allowing them on the property. They're like, you guys mess with us too much. No longer police are allowed on the property. People didn't feel safe going there. It did a lot better and lasted longer as a strip strip club that took its place. Well, you you oh, oh now, not to give the police too much <laughs> heat. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Those those police in that neighborhood, in that town, in that area, in that time, Get were probably Denver, somewhat mirror images of did why everything what happened. Wouldn't be us if there weren't technical difficulties. Yep. Problems with computers sometimes is a is a thing. No, but those police were um probably unfortunately or fortunately in different areas a good representation of the people they're there to protect and serve. Yeah, probably. So there was this underground hippie movement back then starting that people, the general public were um did not like. res- did, they did not want these long haired hippie people. Need well, not apply, man. It goes against the. Uh... 
the norm, you know? That well, it was goes against the, maybe religion, the norm. Like, you're not getting your hair cut. Yeah. I remember I was in high school in 19-whatever, 90-some, and a uh, kid in my math class, Charles, um, I just call him Charles Pumpkin, and uh, <laughs> he's like, he's like, Brian, he's like, your, hair, your hair's touching the top of your ears, man. I was like, yeah, growing it out, you know? But, like, just the top of my ears had a little bit of hair touching it. He's like, dude. Might want to get that taken care of, you know? <laughs> like, whoa, bro. I had a Catholic school in the 90s. I get it, but. Breaks. Yeah. Like, dude, so I can only imagine what these people thought of hippies in the 60s in Denver before right. the switch of Denver. I'm curious. Somebody has to have a great podcast on how Denver changed. So those people, those that would police. Be interesting. Those police are basically doing the job that's being asked by their local the residents ma- the majority it, it, i would say you know, yeah right yeah i'm not saying it's right i'm just exactly. saying it ain't that different from what we're seeing today in a mm. lot of areas i'm it's just not it's a circle man it is a circle these, these police are just growing i mean as a police officer i believe a lot of them grow up in the community that they're serving so they have a pretty good finger on the pulse of what the folks around here want yeah yeah and they're being told what to do by their house i was gonna officers. say everybody has a boss dude yeah so even the sheriff has somebody he answers to. Yeah, it doesn't mean there are not a couple dicks in the mix, but That's whatever. Correct. July 1969. Uh-huh. <laughs> Just prior to Woodstock, Hallelujah, their fourth album is released. Uh, the Melody Maker, a British weekly music magazine, wrote, quote, while less ambitious than some of their work, this is nonetheless an excellent blues-based album, and they remain the most convincing of white eccentric blues groups. Okay. So they're doing good. Uh, within, they always got to get that caveat in there. Well, it seems like, nah, yeah. for white people, for they're white doing people, all right. They do pretty good yeah, at this. Good job. For white people, you're doing all right. Thanks, white guys. I mean, for a, a rapper, Eminem, you know, he's a white dude. He's doing okay. That's my favorite new insult now. It's like, whatever, white lady. <laughs> <laughs> try it out. See how it goes, Ray. <laughs> okay. Like, you're I'll white. I'm like, yeah, I know. Uh, I'll try that on my wife. Whatever, what, yo, dude, if my, that's who I did it to. And she's like, looked at me like, what? Like completely stopped whatever we were talking about. Did she shake her finger at and you like this, Brian? Called like, the cops, no, told me no, 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 to stop no, no, barbecuing. She said, get out of here. So how do I know you have a key to this house? I to, you wouldn't let me in the door. All these things. Uh, within days of the album's release, guitarist Vestane leaves the group after an onstage blow-up at the Fillmore West between him and Larry Taylor, the bass player we're talking about. Oh, that's always professional. Uh, oh, I'm out of here. And uh, with uh, Larry leaving, no, Larry didn't leave. Vestane left. So with Vestane leaving, we're going to take a quick break here. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something unusual because I talked about the 90s in high school. I'm going to play you a section of a song from my high school band called 21 Days. This is 21 Days? Oh, yes. 1994, baby. You guys were really uh, trying to hit the, the sound of the times. It was pretty 90s, I'd say. Mother. Exactly. Very dancing. Oh, Billy. Guitar stylings of Joe Pearson. What's he up to these days? Chicago. Are you gonna beep his name out? Last name, probably. Why? He's on this an album. Oh, you might be right. That's true. Yeah, let him get a little credit for it. Good point. All right. We're gonna let Brian go ahead and round out the rest of this uh, bumper music, li- reliving his lost his youth. Oh, I don't even remember. I'm looking at, so Brian hands me the CD. I'm looking at this picture <laughs> uh, on the back of the, on the back of the CD cover. And I swear the, the, the paper in here is just like, is that real? From the nineties? Yes. You just made this yourself. What's this barcode? I don't know. I wasn't part of it. It looked <laughs> legit barcode. though, right? There's barcode on it. Scan it. it. See what happens. 
It's so stupid. <laughs> Master of QR codes now, but I don't. I didn't know about barcodes. Zebra Tech Productions, Brian. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. High end. Got to get there. I got to get there. So you're you're holding a Kirk Devane in the Bionic Dirt Band CD, also uh, yeah. one of my other many projects. <laughs> this one's this one's just a. Uh, What's even these pictures? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know this. Hey, what do you want to put on the back of this album? I don't know. Uh, a Some gear? gear? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I meant musical gear, but that's fine. <laughs> so here we are. All right, we're back. And it's 1969. Ah. And it's October. Uh, the band releases their third album, Living the Blues, which included their best-known song, Going on the Country, Where I Wanna Go. <laughs> they did that, a pan flute that played. You know the one that you think and look up anything that says Woodstock and that's the song you'll hear, which they didn't get paid for because all their royalties went to that other guy. So. Yeah, yeah, okay. Anyway. Yeah, they, they, <laughs> the guy that yeah. held them over the balcony while they're in jail, it's, metaphorically speaking. That song is almost a note-for-note note copy of Bulldoze Blues by Henry Thomas. Oh, so it's just a re. It's just the the music, not the words. Even down to Thomas's instrumental break on the quills, aka the panpipes, which Jim Horn duplicated on the flute. Oh, there you so, go. okay. Song goes to number one in 25 countries around the world, hits number 11 on the U.S. national charts, and will go on to become the unofficial theme song of Woodstock. So that was their biggest song? Yes. Okay. Well. I mean, no, I mean, that was their most popular. Yeah, noted... yeah, yeah, yeah. As far as overall top songs, number that one. That was it. Okay. Now, <clears throat> to play Woodstock, which they did play, they had to commandeer a helicopter from a local news crew to get to the festival. <laughs> how do you do that i mean the helicopter in the air what do you just like, this is what you do you say fuck you we're going to make the news the bear said and then hurl the reporter through the door quote we're the canned heat it's more important that we get there than you so we're taking this helicopter they they literally commandeer <laughs> that motherfucking helicopter. arriving by a helicopter at woodstock the heat played their most famous set on the second day of the festival right at sunset the set included going up the country which became the title track of the documentary even though the band's performance was not shown uh on the movie woodstock the song was included in the first woodstock album the second woodstock album woodstock 2 contained woodstock boogie which is another one of their songs Later, while on LSD, manager Skip Taylor negotiated an on-site contract for the royalties and the film rights, and then stole a limo for their gig in Atlantic City the next day. This, this, is, the, this is what they do now. <laughs> I mean, Justin Bieber would spit on people. These guys just stole <laughs> Steal, transportation. Steal transportation. They each received $2,000 to play at Woodstock. So I always want to just a quick call back to our, 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 we had some Woodstock information. Oh, yeah. Oh, was it Woodstock or was it the one that was uh, the one up in Northern California? Fremont. Which one was the one that did Eerie George Canal. George Lucas video? George, yeah, that was it. Uh, Freema, the Freema Ultimate. Ultimate. Ultimate, Ultimate Free, Free Festival. Concert. That's yeah, the one. Yeah. Okay. All right. It wasn't Woodstock that George no. Lucas filmed for. Nope. Nope. Okay. Nope. Um, you had Alan Wilson, the guitar harmonica guy, had always suffered from depression. Some say he attempted suicide by driving his van off a road near Bob's house in Topanga Canyon in California. Did he steal the van? Uh, he might. Well, he might have. Unlike other members of the band, Alan did not have much success with women and was deeply upset and frustrated by this. He's in a band he couldn't get laid? He's in a band at Woodstock and he couldn't get laid. He showed up by <laughs> helicopter. That dude must be hit. I didn't see pictures of him. So uh, His depression worsens over time. September 3rd, 1907, just prior to leaving for a festival in Berlin, the band learned of Alan's death by barbiturate overdose. His body was found on a hillside behind Bob's house. Fido, the drummer, and other members of the band believed his death was a suicide. Wilson died at the age of 27, just weeks before Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin. Is that the 27 Club? Thus becoming a number, another member of the infamous 27 Club. Talk about the 27 Club real quick. What? The, eh, I don't believe in it. Well, it's just a group of musical artists and actors and stuff who pass away at 27. When they were 27, yeah. Right. But it big, happened a lot. But I think they could probably look at all the different numbers. I mean, that's a very median name number if uh, there's probably not a 22 club but there's probably a 28 club 29 club 26 club there are oh, just God. as many not notable musicians that died at that uh, on the 20 at, at when they turned 26 i know the answer to this too because there's like a vox article about is the 27 club real they're like no like you're saying they're like yeah. nah the statistics don't bear it out people die more at like 40 or something well, like that than they do at 27 it, doesn't that dude do a pretty good podcast on the 27 club though Oh yeah, yeah. There's a and whole podcast a, called the Twenty Seven. I mean, that's he's true. a very he's a great podcaster. What yeah. he did, uh, he did a he does a big crime one. Does, Are you talking our ultimate competition, uh, Disgraceland? 
Yeah, Disgraceland. Oh, yeah. Fleet, yeah. <laughs> All right. No, but he did the 27 Club. <laughs> he is our competition. We're coming in. We're coming for you. True crime. Ah! <laughs> Lost my what headphones. What did you just do? Caught my foot in my headphones. <laughs> it's like a Woo. ghost just drop kicked Brian in the side of the head ha! a little bit. <laughs> ha! All of a sudden, I look over and Brian's just his neck's cocked to the Gotta left. Gotta keep bobbing and, and weaving. And his headphones are about off his head. That head movement is I don't key, know boys. What happened over there? You're cut off of those beers. Yeah, right. This is a powerful beer. Brown Hound. All right. Joel Scott Hill, who played with the band The Strangers and the Joel Hot Scott Hill Trio, was recruited to fill in for Alan because he, he's dead. I call it The Stranger. I sit on my hand for 20 minutes. I see. <laughs> <laughs> strange. That is pretty strange. Uh, the band still You've had... never heard that? Yes, I have. Okay. I was just trying to get past it. The band still has a touring contract for September, though, right? I mean, the guy died. They get a replacement, but they got studio dates, and they got touring contracts. So at the end of 1971, they finally figure out they get a new studio album going. They're just sort of filling in. They're just like, come on, just join the band. You know, it's fine. Um, they had an album called Historical Figures and Ancient Heads. Which the name was... Canned Heat, though, is weird. So would you want to call him Sterno? I don't know. It makes me think of farts or something. I, I don't know. All right. Well, they got these new people. That lineup doesn't last long. The band's in disarray. Scott Hill and Delabara's attitude were not fitting in with the rest of the band. The drummer, Fido, he decides to call it quits. He's like, I'm out. Uh, he was talked out of it by, uh, by Bob, though. He was Bob, talked out of quitting? Yeah. Bob's like, no, we need you. You're a good drummer. And then it was Scott Hill and... and De La Barra, they left the band. They're like, you're not talking us back into it. New additions of the group are this guy, James Shane on rhythm guitar and vocals, Ed Byer on keyboards, so they brought in a keyboard player, and they get Bob's brother, Richard Height, on the bass. So there's like two dudes that are original members. I know it's bass. I just say it funny. Yes, so far, we've only got two guys who are still in there. Okay. The bear and the owl, pretty sure. Okay. Still rocking it. So, met with hard times, the band resorts to importing drugs from Mexico to make ends meet between shows. Oh, they're now drug dealers. <laughs> they're traffickers, actually. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's well, a I mean, yeah. Okay, so they're they're the mules. Middlemen. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever taped anything to your large intestine? Uh, taped? No. That's an office. <laughs> uh, Have in you th- ever pooped a balloon? <laughs> the Heat uh, are over 30 grand in debt. Manager Skip Taylor advises the band to sign away their future royalties to, you know, to Liberty Records. And uh, then left, we jump to Atlantic Records. We can start fresh with a new contract. So the band, after a bad introduction to Atlantic Records, yeah, yeah. switches over. Um, there was, indentured servants. There was, while they were get a signing up at Atlantic, there was actually a physical brawl between Bob and this Vestine dude over a vending machine. He's like, that's my candy bar. Oh, well, it fell when I was doing it. Well, it didn't fall. <laughs> you, know, you shook the machine. So the band releases They're an all al- Twix. <laughs> the band releases an album, One More River to Cross, in 1973. Um, we're gonna jump a little bit more here because basically what happens is uh, they're popular, but the 70s are closing out. It's coming into the 80s, so they they floundered for a long time. Yeah, they couldn't get that steam going. It was hard to maintain because people were in and out, stuff like that. So April 4th, 1981, the Heat has a gig at the Palomino Club in North Hollywood. Bob the Bear height, 300 pounds of California gregariousness and pharmaceutical fearlessness, it says. That's how he was 300 pounds? Yeah, big fella. Oh, wow. Uh, was he always that big, you think? Yeah. Oh, all, he's all always pictures, a big dude. Just, all the pictures, just always a big dude. Like a big uncle with big beard sitting in the back. They call him Bear, you know? I mean, okay. He's a bear. Well, I don't know if he's a bear, but he looks like a bear. Anyway. Is that a gay joke? <laughs> yeah, it's April 4th, 91, uh, 81. Bear's super sky high at this Palomino Club right in Hollywood. Before the show, he and his wife Susan, she's another super big drug addict and alcoholic, they both injected grandma cocaine directly into their veins. You can do that with cocaine? Apparently. What right? do you got to mix that with, you think? Water? I think, isn't that the spoon and the needle and you just, whoosh, isn't that liquid crack or something isn't like that? that? No, because what's his name? Crosby was doing liquid cocaine also, remember? He yeah. He was putting I, in alcohol I, or something like that. Again, we're going we're, <laughs> we're to show uh, the... Okay, we, we are all, f- I mean, for some drugs, but there's some drugs I'm not for, and that's one of them. I don't know how to do it. It's, it's too complicated. Uh, yeah, I don't want needles in an too instruction com- manual. Too complicated. Uh, right before the gig, a man rumored to be a former Israeli tank commander pulls out a vial of smack heroin, pink Persian gear, offers it to the bear. After he's done the coke? Yeah. Okay. So Makes legend sense. has it that the bear would snort anything under his nose or stuffed into his mouth. So Fido, the drummer, peers out from behind the drum set, and he goes to Bob. He goes, hey, careful, bro. This trash is strong. This, this, this tank commander from Israel. 
Yeah. Okay. And then uh, Bob's like, quote, this shit ain't even going to get me high, Fido. Don't even worry about it. So Bob doesn't take a taste, right? He grabs the vial, <laughs> snorts the whole thing. Oh, wow. Right. Within seconds, all 300 pounds of the bear comes crashing to the floor, starts turning blue, first sign of an OD, in case you don't know. Someone then apparently tried to revive him with giving him two huge lines of coke. Like, oh, I think his heart stopped. Let's put. So without even thinking about it, Bob snorts it up without waking up like autopilot. Just <laughs> say Hoover and Ups. <laughs> You're Schneeve. Give him a cookie. He can't chew a cookie. Who put cookies in his mouth? You're not supposed to do that. The Heat leave the singer in the dressing room and go back to the stage to f- finish the show. That was like set break. <laughs> so we're going to play a couple songs without the singer. We don't. It's just the singer. It's just the singer. Nobody seemed concerned because Bob had done this so many times before. Right before they hit the stage again, somebody suggests we should probably move him. <laughs> like, you know. So Bob is dragged through the dirt by his ankles. He's 300 pounds. Yeah. They loaded him into the back of a van, take him to Fido's house. Somehow they get him into bed when they get him there, and they leave him there thinking he's going to wake up the next day like he always does and does his Bob quote, uh, what the fuck happened? And then everyone goes, er, you got wasted again. <laughs> this is a regular occurrence for this it Happens dude. all the, the time. The way they're handling this, and I believe the account here shows that he did this often. A, a lot. <laughs> they had a routine. I'm put, assuming he's dead. Put him feet up. Except this time the bear does not wake up the next morning in the early hours of April 5th while Canned Heat are closing their second set with the 40-minute jam fried hockey boogie. Bob dies in the back of a van that's taken uh, him to Fido's house. Permanent hibernation for the bear. That's true. That's not a bad way of thinking about it, <clears> I guess. Their manager partakes of his usual breakfast, quarter mayonnaise, followed by a jar of pure speed, which he tips into a large glass of Pepsi. A quarter mayonnaise. <laughs> that's what I said. That's what they caught me on that. Uh, sidebar. Yeah. No, sidebar. Well, I uh, want to. I'm going to share this with our listening audience. Uh, oh, this is good sidebar. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Picture this. Picture you go to this. a, a oh, restaurant, a diner, not a real fancy place, but I'm not saying McDonald's either. I'm saying somewhere in the middle. Greasy spoon. Greasy spoon. Leo's. Yeah. There you go. And you order some salad or some uh, chicken wings. Or you get some chicken strips or some pizza even sometimes. Yeah, and yeah. you get that little side dish of oh, ranch, okay. ranch dressing. Yes, sir. Ranch dressing. Oh, yeah. And you eat that ranch dressing. You're and good. you're just like, why can't I buy this at the store? Don't ruin ranch for me, dude. No, I'm not. No, no, okay. no, no. No, <laughs> okay. I'm going to say, don't I'm ruin bringing it to a high much. level here for you, Bri. I like this. Get ready for it. Get Everybody get your pens and pencils out because I got the, I have. Notes. I have the recipe. So my kids and I were going, um. We went down to the grandma and grandpa's house. They're they're my in laws, yeah, okay. and we get uh, um, Jets pizza. Nice thick yeah, crust. Good, good good pizza. And they always get this big bottle of ranch, Jets ranch. <laughs> and they all talk how like it's the best ranch ever. It's this ranch. It's the it's like in every restaurant, every greasy spoon will say, "Oh, it's homemade ranch." Right. It's our recipe. Um, it's all the same shit. But you you can't go buy it. I've tried a couple things. I went to like Gordon's, went to Sam's, I went to a couple restaurants, couple places. Right. Tried to find this ranch. Can't find the ranch. Found the recipe. Uh-oh. It's it's pretty simple. Egg it's whites and equal parts heavy mayo, which you can ah, use Hellman's mayo. God, that's where the mayo thing. I'm I'm on this right now. Ruining man, ruining ranch for me, dude. Why? Because it's got mayo in it. I hate mayo. I well, don't like not mayo. in ranch. <sighs> and then so half mayo. That's true. <laughs> half buttermilk, like oh, cultured okay. buttermilk. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Just half and half. And then the proper amount of Hidden Valley Ranch or ranch <laughs> s- seasoning. So there's no actual, like, so you're just doing a uh, ranch packet with buttermilk in it and mayo. It, that's it. Gotcha. That's it. Then put it, like, with an immersion blender or in the blender, mix it up real good, let it set for, like, 20 minutes. You got to refrigerate it. That's kind of the thing. That's why ranch at restaurants is better. The way it is is because, you know, when you go buy a bottle of ranch at your grocery store, it's out on the shelf. It's been, it's been homogenized. It's been... They got different things in there to make sure it doesn't have to be yeah, yeah. in the in the freeze in the refrigerator section. Right. But at the restaurants, they make it so daily. They just mix these things together real quick, put, put it through it a blender, there. squirt it in little cups, and it is it is good. And it's a little runnier than your normal. Like that's what I like about it. Though. Yeah, it's so good. We got a local place in town that makes their own ranch. Quote unquote, makes their own ranch. Dude, but was, it's so good. Well, you can you can tweak it now if you want to add a little bit more dill. Or you want to cut the buttermilk and add some cream instead. There you go. Or do some extra little tweaks to it. Lemon juice. I've heard lemon juice is a thing. Oh, yeah. But the base recipe. 
heavy mail. It can't heavy be mail. Miracle Whip. Don't. I've tried Miracle Whip. Didn't work. Blah. 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 I, I like Miracle Dip. It's called Dippity Doo. But the uh, the the the, the Hellman's is the one you can buy like at the store as heavy mail. And if you go to like a Gordon Fruit Food Service, they literally it says heavy, heavy mail. mail. <laughs> All right, there we go. Sidebar. So this dude. Now just go back to what this guy was <laughs> literally. He was just eating. Well, you know, your lead singer dies, and the manager's like, "All right, man, guess we're back to the old ways." And so he just pops out a jar of pure speed and tips it into a glass of Pepsi and eats quarter mail. Okay, I don't get that. I don't either. All right, it's, maybe it's like the apple cider vinegar thing. I don't I know. Use, People drink it. I would use Coke, but Coke with his so, feet. So uh, Coke. There you go. Coke. That's not. That's All right. All right, but then this dude also uh, smothers a whole chicken with mayo and then demolishes that too, washes it all down with Pepsi, and he says, too bad about Bob, but uh, heroin's for losers. And that's the that's the story, that's the take we'd like to make for our um, listening. Heroin is for losers. Kids. Isolate the audio, kids. But heroin's for losers. There you go. Bob's death is a shock, but perhaps not as much of a shock as it might have been if they hadn't already lost one member 11 years earlier. Crack is whack. It heroin's doesn't take long. Losers. It doesn't take long for the group to come to a, uh, a decision. The Heat survived the death of one member. They can just survive the death of another. <laughs> we, we'll all die. We'll so die according to Fido, quote, it was what the bear would have wanted. Don't forget, to boogie was his thing. So we're going to keep on boogieing for him. You know, that's what they were saying. <laughs> that's how we would have wanted it. The bear's death and the harmonica player Rick Kellogg, uh, he joins because, he's you know, they need a harmonica player. No, the bear's dead. Uh, they finish off the King's Boogie album. This incarnation of canned heat without Bob Height was nicknamed Mouth Band. That's, I, I, they, they need more work on their names. <laughs> you don't like the Mouth Band? I don't like canned heat Mouth Band. <laughs> they were a huge hit in Australia, especially with the biker crowd. Like, the, like bicyclers. No, 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 no. Biker bikers, like leathers and chaps and all that stuff. The band toured the States playing biker bars and began working on a video known as, quote, The Boogie Assault, starring canned heat and various members of the San Francisco chapter of the Hells Angels. Hmm, okay. So they got those guys at the bike spokes from the uh, Ultimate Free concert. It was like, hey, you want to be in a video? Sure. One percenter, man. Uh, as production of the video dragged on, Drunken Vestine got into a brawl with Ernie Rodriguez and once again out of the band, this time replaced by guitarist Walter Trout. And this is where I pretty much stopped. I had more things I could have went to, but I just summed it up of the revolving door that was Canned Heat continues. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't. It, nobody's original. It's like the Mickey Mouse Club here. We'll, we'll get there in just a sec here. We're going to jump to 1995. James Thornberry, he leaves the band with no hard feelings after 10 years of service. And, you know, he gets married, moves to, to Australia. New frontman Robert Lucas comes in to take his place. So after the bear, there's some people. And then there's James Thornberry. And then there's this new guy, Robert Lucas. 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 So it comes back to the George Lucas thing. It's all, it comes back around your face. Yeah. October 20th, 1997, following the final gig of a European tour, cancer stricken Vestine dies in Paris, France. So then Taylor and Watson leave the band. Lucas returns to Can Heat in late 2005, but leaves again in fall 2008. He dies at age 46 on November 23rd, 2008, at a friend's house in Long Beach, California. Apparently, it was a large drug overdose. Man, some of these guys, they did drugs all their life. It seems you think like they'd a get good way. at it. <laughs> like, know, know your limits. More recent deaths of the band members include Bob Height's brother, bassist Richard, like we talked about. He died at 50 years old on September 22nd, 2001 at the age of 50. I just said 50 twice. Due to complications of cancer, so it wasn't a drug OD, former bassist Antonio De La Barra died of a heart attack on February 17th, 2009. Cocaine-induced heart attack. August 19, 2019, longtime bassist Larry Taylor dies after a 12-year battle with cancer. The current lineup of Heat features none of the original or classic era members of the band except for Adolfo Fido de la Pera on the drums. Wait, there's still, he's still a thing today? He goes in and out, in and out. Oh, dude, uh, yeah, here's a rundown. We'll get there in one second. Here's a rundown of the 66 members of Canned Heat. Are you kidding me? 25 guitar players, 13 different bass players, 10 different vocalists, 5 keyboard players, 5 harmonicas, 2 saxophones, 1 tromboner, a flutist, Flautist. And one slap bass player. That's awesome. Okay, now I like this band. And they had how many different members? <laughs> 66. <laughs> Three more, man. Come on, you got this. If you would like to see. Oh, that's starting the, early. We're, we're if not, you would like over. to see. 
I got more things I want to hear about this band. If you would like to see the Heat, they are currently touring the east coast of the United States, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, all through April. General admission tickets about 30 bucks. Do they ever go to Denver? Straight out of Denver, baby. <laughs> Quote from canned Heat bass player Larry Taylor. This is a non-contact system that's good for the manatees. Um, sh- okay, that's a good quote. Canned heat, everybody! Woo! Woo! All right, so this band. I mean, they're, <laughs> we, right. we're, we're going to re, re, uh, relabel this episode, not crime and music. It's going to be cr- uh, music and drugs. Yeah, <laughs> there was a little bit of crime in there with all those drugs. But there. man, they had a billion different members dude that's why revolving door yeah i started reading about them because i'm like wait a minute what do you mean a biker gang band what are you talking about and then i start reading about the bear and how he like dies and i'm just like geez can he they're now just a a, they're their own subgenre. there's an article out there it's called canned heat the band's so awesome even death can't kill it (laughs) you're like okay And I wonder oh. how many, and maybe I'm just in a bubble of can, a, a canned heat bubble. I'm out. <laughs> everything heat. outside of my bubble is canned heat, but I haven't heard a lot about them. No. Yeah. It, but I think that's maybe because of the lack of consistent members. So nobody ever, like, after the 70s era, there were never stars in the band because they all died. Like, I f- everybody died. I feel like I may know somebody that was in that band. <laughs> I think I know somebody who can't eat. I mean, I didn't. I didn't. I'm, and one day I'm going to be, like, at a family reunion. I'll be talking about can't eat. And my, I, like, creepy uncle was like, yeah, I was in that band for a couple months. <laughs> Huh? What? What'd you do? I was the flautist. You know what? If you're in your 60s or early 70s and you're a straight white looking guy, I would claim to be in canned heat because they're going to have a problem proving you're wrong. There's a chance if you were in a band in the in the early 80s and you did a lot of drugs and you don't really remember <laughs> exactly what band it was. You might have been in canned heat. You might have been in canned heat. That might have been the band. I thought there was a bear and an owl. And I don't oh, man. It was, it was a weird bunch time, of bikers. Man. I thought it was in a biker group. I was just looking to trade records. Next thing I know, I'm yeah. in canned uh, heat. All right. Canned heat. There it, there it is. There it is. You like that? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and no. with that... We're going to get out of here for yet another episode of Crime and Music. If you like it, please subscribe, share with a friend. We've got the entire continental U.S. and Alaska and Hawaii, so... We're, 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 we we now have to go outside of our, uh, our I mean, globe. we got to get people like out from other planets. We almost have all of South America, too, just to let you know. We're a little thin and, like... We ain't thin nowhere. Name a South American country. No, uh, we got like Brazil, Argentina, Peru, Chile. Bolivia? Uh, I don't think we have Bolivia. You're Is that right. a country or a city? It's a country. I think it's a country. It's Is a it country. in South America? Is Lisbon the capital of Spain or what's the capital of Spain? Recall versus... Portugal? No, that's a, that's a country. Reference. Yeah, we're American. We don't know a lot of things. I got a map. It just highlights it. It doesn't say the name of the country, but I can pick, shit, pick, pick it out by like the, the outline. Over so in Europe? If I could see Europe. If I could see what's up in your... <laughs> How far are you? All right, guys, we're going to get out of here. Like the song says, never trust a big butt and a smile. Unless it was in candy.